will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, 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 grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. What's not to love about you? Heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. Son of God, you are the one. You are the one we're living for. You are the love. time we will sing we will sing 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 and make music with the heavens we will sing 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 grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise lift high the name of Jesus Good morning, everyone. I know things look a little different this morning, so I'd just like to welcome you here this morning. For those of you joining us online, I'm smiling under my mask this morning. I know that expression is very important, isn't it? When we smile, it, it really does give us a certain connection, doesn't it? And, but you know, sometimes that... Um, I wonder what Jesus had to put up to go to the cross for us in perspective of what we have to do maybe to wear a mask to come to church to, to be a part of the service this morning, you know. Just think of all that he has done for us. You know, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His spirit hasn't changed, and he's here with us this morning. His hand is extended to each one of us this morning. You know, I was thinking about a church family. You know, this is our family, isn't it? You know, when you, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become part of the family of God. God adopts you into his family, and you become his child. And if you're his child, then we're brothers and sisters here this morning. You know what the awesome thing about being a believer is you can go anywhere in the world, and you can have an instant connection. You can have instant fellowship with other believers because of, of, of we got the same father. And that's just, that's so awesome. And the beautiful thing about, about being a Christian is it, it's not exclusive. It's open to everybody, whosoever will. That no matter what race, no matter what, what, uh, what age, no matter what it is, that Jesus extends his hand and he, he invites you to be a part of the family of God. Maybe it's your first time here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus, or maybe you're joining us online this morning. In the midst of all the chaos, God extends his, his love towards you, and he would love to have you to be a part of his family this morning. So this morning, as we continue to worship, you know, we don't worship so that Matt and, and, and the, the worship team can get up here and entertain us. That's not what worship's about. We don't worship so we can sing a few new songs. We worship as an expression of our thankfulness extended towards God for all that he's done for us. 
So this morning, as we worship, let's not just sing or let our mind uh, wander and, and focus on other things, but help the words that we're singing this morning be an expression of, your, of our love to the Lord and thank him for all that he's done for us. So as we continue this morning, just keep that in mind. God bless. Praise you today, O oh Lord. We lift up your name with one voice. We declare your praise. Now David said, Let's let all that is within me praise his name. All that is within me praise his name. We praise you today, Lord. Praise the Lord. can't silence our praise today. Oh, praise the sound of praise today as we sing praise the
time, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the in your own words I love how my wife said this morning she said even though we have masks on this is a great opportunity to make our praise even louder louder than it's ever been before as we sing hallelujah as we say you're worthy God we say you're worthy of all the praise that we can give as we sing to our God to our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing Alleluia. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing Alleluia. Hallelujah. Up from the ashes. Been up from the ashes. Your love has brought us out of the darkness into the light. Lifting our soul. verse and chains have been broken eyes have been opened army of dry bones is starting to rise death is defeated we are victorious you are alive hold oh, to our God
in this place we lift you up you are our God there's none like you it's rising up it's rising up Pause your praise a sound of praise a song of praise oh it's rising up rising up it's rising up we won't be silent nothing can hinder our worship today cause you are our God you're worthy of it all worthy of it all Worthy of it all, you are worthy, Jesus. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. As we sing hallelujah. We sing song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring You're worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
trust in you alone You're the one we live for You're the one we desire Lord, we worship you alone We love you Everyone turn to your neighbor and just give a big smile. <laughs> and so I hope that everyone can see everyone's smiles with their eyes, and we can imagine what the smiles look like as we reminisce to the good old days when we could actually see smiles just last week. But, um, but nonetheless, we will obey the laws of our land, and it is a blessing to be able to even meet together today. And I was actually thinking about it, and I was like, when, when I found out that we had to have masks, masks on stage, I was like, that's going to be really tough for Matt to sing. And I was thinking, I was like, there are still parts in the world that can't meet aside from COVID. COVID aside, there's parts of the world where the church is persecuted. There are parts of the world where they can't get together. And we're able to be here together and sing praise. We're able to be here together, build one another up, encourage one another. And that's the blessing, and that's why we're here today. We're here together because of Christ, and it is an amazing blessing that we're even able to do that. And so, church, if someone came to you today and asked you, what do I get for being a Christian? What, what's in it for me? What do I get for being a Christian? What would you say? Relationship with Christ. That's good. Anything else? Feel free to... Get to go to heaven. That is a good one. Actually, that was, we did that whole sermon a couple months ago on that. Anything else? Peace. That's a good one, too. And so what mostly came to my mind when I was thinking about this is I was thinking grace, redemption, forgiveness, victory, peace with God, and, and all these things that were also mentioned. But the one word that encompasses all of that is Jesus. All of those things are through Jesus. All of those things are from Jesus. All of those things are by Jesus. The one word that encompasses everything that we get is Jesus. So what is in following Jesus? Jesus. He is the reward. Above all things, Christ and him crucified for our sins. The sufficiency of Christ through all 
things in any season of life through anything we go through is the staple of being a follower of Christ. If you think about it, his final work on the cross is sufficient. There's nothing we need to do as a work. So the sufficiency of his work on the cross is a staple. The sufficiency of his perfect, sinless nature to take our place. And the sufficiency of simply Jesus and nothing else. Jesus being enough. Jesus being our delight for eternity. Jesus is sufficient. He is our everything. And so today I want to explore what that means as we work through Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 2. And now, last time, I had the privilege to speak. Uh, we dove into Peter's sermon in Acts 2, and we studied Christ's lordship. And we learned that Jesus being called the Greek word kyrios, we're just going to do a quick refresher on that. So when Paul and Peter and Luke, when he's writing, was calling Jesus kyrios, the Greek word, he was essentially calling him Yahweh, because that was a translation which meant Lord, which actually in the Old Testament was translated to Yahweh. So they were saying Jesus is God every time they call him Lord. And this is important because we need to know who Jesus was in order to understand why we are saved through him. Because the Jews were expecting a Messiah or a Christ to save them, but Jesus was more than that. He couldn't just be the Messiah, he had to also be the Lord. For example, he was perfect and one with God in order to atone for our sins and not be held by death, right? He had to be Lord to not be held by death. Um, he has to be Lord in order for us to be saved by calling upon his name because Joel 2.32 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, which was Yahweh, will be saved. And we call upon Jesus to be saved. So Jesus isn't just this worldly Messiah or the Christ, he is also Lord. And so that Lordship brings us to Colossians 2, because a lot of what Peter said in that sermon in Acts 2, Paul says a lot of the same things in Colossians 1. So there's this beautiful poem in Colossians where Paul says that he is the, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I'm just going to summarize some of it. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. Think about that statement for a second. He is before all things. And if you think back to Exodus 3, when Moses asks God, well, what do I say your name is? When God says his divine attribute, the thing that differentiates him from everyone else, he says, I am who I am. He is before all things. He exists on his own. He's not created. He is who he is. So then Paul says, Jesus is before all things. He's not created. He's one with God. And if that's not enough, he also says, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so now we're at Colossians 2. And as you see Paul's natural flow of thought, he says, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is one with God. Now, what are we going to do about it? And that's where we are. So let's open our Bibles together today. If you don't have a Bible, pull out your phone. It's really easy to Google it. We're going to go verse by verse through Colossians 2 and just work out what it means to be the church, what it means to be rooted in Christ, and what it means for Christ to be sufficient in everything. And just remember, when Paul was writing, he didn't write in chapters. So it was, for the most part, one long continued thought. The chapters are just there for us. And so we're going to start in Colossians 1, verse 28, just two verses above chapter 2. And so Colossians 1, 28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, right away off the beginning... Him we proclaim. Christ we proclaim. You think back to 1 Corinthians 2, 1, 2, when Paul says that he came to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. He didn't come with lofty wisdom. He didn't come with cunning speech. We proclaim Christ. And so that everyone may be mature in Christ. So once again, right off the beginning, we proclaim Christ so that we may be in Christ. Christ 
Christ. <laughs> and then the next verse says, For this I toil, struggling with all this energy that he powerfully works within me. For I forgot, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Which is Christ. And so here, Paul actually gives us the focus of a godly church. He says, their hearts may be encouraged, that they may be knit together in love, and that they would reach all assurance all the riches of full assurance of understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. And not only does he tell us this, he says he toils and he struggles for this. Isn't it funny how often we make it about other things? Do you know what Paul didn't write? Paul didn't say, I, Paul, struggle that your drums may be mixed quieter, that your decorations would look better and that Martha would do a better job with the post-service coffee. No, see, Paul struggles and he toils that we would encourage one another. He struggles, he toils that we would be knit together in love and that we would have full assurance of Christ. And so let's start with that first one there. When was the last time you toiled Toiled, I mean struggled, I mean went out of your way so that someone's heart would be encouraged. Or better yet, when was the last time your heart was encouraged? I hope it was when you came in this building this morning, because that's what the church is for. That's what Paul's toil and his struggle is for the church, that our hearts may be encouraged through Christ. Then he goes on to say that we would be knit together as one body. And so Paul, using the term knit together in love, is not just saying that we would be beside one another in love, but that we would actually be knit together in love. And he's using body language here. Because you read in 1 Colossians, in the first chapter, that he says that Christ, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. And so we are to be knit together as one body through his love and through our love for one another. And that's not just a convenient love when it's easy for us love. It's a full-on sacrificial love, the kind of love that loves when it isn't easy, the kind of love that lays down one's life for its friends. And I find it incredible that (laughs) Jesus died in my place, and sometimes I don't want to give someone a ride. Like, really, (laughs) y'all? But like, that's, that's inside of me. And this is why Paul is struggling and toiling that we can be sanctified, that we can know Jesus, that we can be knit together in love the same way he loved us. Because that is what the body is called to do. Which leads us to Paul's final point, that we may have full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. And so these are the things that he struggles for, that our hearts may be encouraged through Christ, that we'll be knit together in love through Christ, and that we may have full understanding of God's mystery, which is Christ. He then goes on to say, verse 3, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, Rejoicing to see your good order in the firmness of your faith in Christ. And so he's saying, in Jesus is hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he says this so that no one may come with plausible arguments and lead us astray. That we would be rooted in Christ, knowing that all knowledge is found in him. And we're going to come back to that after. But do you guys find it interesting how when Paul rejoices about the church in Colossae, he says, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Isn't it odd that he rejoices in their good order? And why is that paired with firmness of faith? And and the more you think about it, the more you start to realize that if you look at a church like Corinth, or there was 
Paul had to write four letters to Corinth. <laughs> there were problems upon problems upon problems in the church of Corinth. Once the apostles died, other people were writing letters to the church of Corinth because they were having church split after church split and problem after problem. They were the epitome of disorder, right? And so to the point where in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says to them, if someone came into your church today, they would say you're crazy. <laughs> Think about that. Paul, so unashamed of the gospel to the point of dying for the faith, so unashamed to face persecution for Christ, says, guys, if someone came in your church, they'd think you're crazy. <laughs> Paul is saying this. And then you start to wonder, well, why is that ordered with firmness of faith? And well, because the truth is that we see what the Holy Spirit does. Um, we know that the Holy Spirit's ministry and the purpose of his gifts is to reveal Christ. Everything is about Christ. John 16 says, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and will guide us in all truth. So this makes sense that Paul would pair good order with firmness of faith. He says, I rejoice in your good order and your firmness and faith. Because as we allow the Holy Spirit to intercede on our behalf, as we allow the Holy Spirit to move, as we allow the Holy Spirit to do its ministry, it brings us to Christ. It brings us to repentance, which brings us to truth, which brings us to Jesus, which then means we have firmness in faith. And so Paul rejoices in their firmness of faith. Once again, it brings us to Jesus, as verse 3 said, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then as we read on through verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What does it mean to be rooted in the faith? What does it mean to be established in the faith? And sorry, rooted in Jesus, not the faith. Well, it means that everything we do is through him. Every single thought, every single philosophy, every single political idea we do is thought through the lens of Christ because we are rooted in him. We are established in our faith. When you think of a root, you think of how deep they can go in some of those massive trees, like let's say in the Amazon or out in BC, and how far and massive those roots are where they're almost a tree themselves. And something comes and it cannot move that because it's rooted. And then he pairs this with saying, established in your faith. Now, there's a huge difference between being established in your faith and believing your faith. You can believe something, and as soon as someone comes with, like Paul said, plausible arguments, you start to go, hmm, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But when you're established in your faith, when you know the word of God, when you are rooted in Christ, someone comes with these plausible arguments of the world, and you say, oh, hold on, hold on. What does the Bible say about that? What does Jesus say about that? And that's where Paul then goes on. He says in verse 8, sorry for clearing my throat. That's a dangerous thing to do in this season. <laughs> One time I had to sneeze in a grocery store and I was so worried. <laughs> I just had to. It was just, I don't know if the if air pressure or something, but... Um, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul says something similar in Ephesians 4 when he says, be rooted or so that um, you will not be tossed to and fro by every human doctrine. And then he says, for in him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. And again, we're back to who Christ is. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive, but be rooted in Christ, because in him, the fullness of God dwells bodily. And so we're right back 
full circle. I think what we're going to do is we're going to come back to this, but for time's sake, because Colossians is a long thing, we're going to read the rest of chapter 2, and then we're going to pick a few key verses in there. And so we'll go from 8 again. He said, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, and raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses, trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so as we read the rest of Colossians 2, we start to see the progression of the book of Colossians. We see chapter 1, Jesus is Lord. And then you see in the beginning of chapter 2, live as his body. Be rooted in him against the thoughts of the world. Because this perfect Lord has made you alive and has nailed your debt to the cross, so be free from the world, and don't rebind yourself to the world. You see this flow of thought? He goes from who Jesus is, why we should be rooted in him, why we should not listen to things that are not of him, how he saved us, and again, why we should not rebind ourselves to the very things that he saved us from. Because we do this. You know, the church was dealing with something different in Colossae. They were likely dealing with Gnosticism and asceticism and all these things that we're not really, really dealing with the same way today. But we've had 2,000 years to deal with different things of the world and for the enemy to try to bring other worldly things into the church. And so you may say, well, Christians aren't really dealing with Gnosticism today, but what are we dealing with? What are the elemental spirits of the world? What are the human traditions? What are the things in our lives that aren't built through Christ? And well, what about the very first thing that he mentioned? It was the same then as it is today, philosophy. Human philosophy. Philosophy is trying to find truth without God. And when we submit ourselves to that, we are trying to find truth outside of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't philosophy that goes along with Christ, but there's also philosophy that is trying to answer the questions that Christ gives. Right now, um, in the philosophical world and also the political world, we have two extreme ideas going against one another, and they're both working their way into the church. On one extreme end, we have what you would call the modernists, the enlightenment thinkers, people who want to solve everything, 
Everything can be solved by reason. Everything can be solved by facts. Everything can be explained. You start trying to explain the universe through science. You start trying to explain everything. Everything can be solved. And on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, the world is in a really big divide right here. You get what you would call the postmodernist, where all truth is subjective. There is no objective truth. Everything is relative based on who's experiencing it. And the truth is, in Christ, there isn't room for either of those. Because if you want to say that truth is subjective, and we want to let that in the church and say, always go to heaven, well, truth is objective, and his name is Jesus. There is only one way to the Father, and it is through Jesus. And on the other end, if you try to solve everything, then we go against Christ. Isaiah 55 says his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. We read in verse 4 of this, that, or um, verse 3, that in whom are hi hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All truth, again, is in Christ, and we can't solve all of it. There is room for mystery and rest in Christ. And yet we try to bring both of these things in the world and put them with Christ when everything we need is found in Christ and he is sufficient. There are many other things that we try to bring in from the world. What about politics? I'm not going to pick a side or talk about politics, but have you ever realized that everyone seems to think Jesus would have been in their political party? Have you ever stopped to think about that? And there's someone there who's thinking, well, Jesus would have been in mind. What are you talking about, Yako? Um, but the truth is that, that I've seen it in my personal life where politics has been an idol, where I've searched for truth and looked at everything in the lens of politics and philosophy instead of Christ and the word of God. There's other things, too. Back then, they were dealing with asceticism, the, the denial of self. People were basically saying that you need to do more to earn Christ. Go and be a monk. Cut off your arm. <laughs> Eat nothing but rice and water for the rest of your life, as if Christ's final work on the cross isn't enough. And we see like a flip of that in the modern society today. Find your Zen. Find your higher self. Do these things as if finding yourself is not being found in Jesus as if there's something more you can do than the sufficiency of his cross. But on the opposite end of this asceticism and self-denial, we get this American dream of the church where everything is the exact opposite, and it's make more money, live in a bigger house, have the biggest church, have the biggest things. And all of these things that Christ freed us from, we rebind ourselves by needing these things. When Christ is sufficient in everything, anything the world has to offer will go, well, <laughs> the song Amazing Grace, the earth will soon dissolve like snow. But the Lord who called me here below will be forever mine. Jesus is sufficient over all problems and these things that the cross freed us from. It freed us from stress of worldly things. It freedom freed us from trying to search for truth in worldly philosophies. It freed us from our lives being defined by money and health and things like that. And we take the gospel and we rebind ourselves to these things sometimes when Jesus is sufficient, when Jesus is enough. And this is why Paul toiled. This is why Paul struggled that they would know that Christ is sufficient to be rooted in Christ as to not be tossed to and fro. Because any doctrine that says that Christ is not sufficient or diminishes his sufficiency distorts the gospel. Anything that says Jesus isn't enough, that you need this, or you need to search for truth here, or you need to get this, or you need to get that, distorts the gospel. Whether it's trying to work for your salvation when the gospel is settled, when it is a gospel of rest, when the work has been paid, it has been finished, it is done, it says in Colossians that he nailed it to the cross, if you try to earn your salvation, that is a false, distorted gospel. 
But if you live your life looking for truth in the world, when the truth has a name and it's Jesus and all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in him, then that is a false, distorted gospel. The gospel that is true is that Jesus Christ is Lord and he was crucified in our place, freeing us from the elemental spirits of the world. And this is why we toil to be rooted in Christ. So that no human doctrine can toss us to and fro. So that we aren't held captive by worldly tradition and human thoughts and things that will dissolve like snow. That we are rooted in Christ. We are made alive in him. And it is no longer us who live, but him who lives through us. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die in our place, Lord. We just together, Lord, we say that we only want you, Jesus. You are sufficient. You are enough, Lord. Give me Jesus and nothing else, Lord. We thank you for your finished work on the cross. We thank you that we are redeemed. We thank you that we are alive. We thank you that we are free from the world and that truth is found in you, Lord. We thank you that you loved us enough to choose us and take our place on the cross, Lord, and cancel that debt so that we can spend eternity with you, Lord. And so we just pray that you would be with us, that you would guide us, that your Holy Spirit would come into us, that it would guide us in all truth, Lord, and that it would bring us closer to you. And so we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your mercy. And we just pray today, Lord, that as we are here with one common thing, and that is Jesus, that we would be encouraging one another, that we would be encouraged by you, that we would be knit together in love as one body under the head, Jesus. And we just give you all the glory, all the praise, and we just thank you for what a loving, good Father you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand together and let's worship. to you.